everybody. Welcome to episode number 559 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Are you ready for some FMCs, FPGAs, and 3D printing in space? First, my guest is Patrick Machine from Techway, and we are investigating current trends in high-speed communication and the benefits of optical interfaces in military and aerospace designs. Also this week, I check out some exciting new advancements in 3D printing in microgravity. So first, please welcome Patrick to Fish Fry. Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Hello, Emilia. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about our product. Absolutely. So everyone is talking about high-speed communication these days. And to address these issues, Techway has a series of optical interfaces and FPGA cards, right? Yeah, that's correct. And we've been doing that for almost 10 years now. So what kind of benefits are you seeing when it comes to these solutions versus other solutions on the market today? In fact, it's uh, using optical is a very strong trend on our marketplace. It has been uh, clearly explained again this morning during the ETT session. I would say most of the people who talked about what they were doing, they were all raising that issue of uh, modern embedded system needs high speed, uh, high bandwidth, and require optical in order to implement these high bandwidth communication links. So we've been exposed to that 10 years ago at Techway. The project that initiated this work at Techway was an avionic project with Airbus, just to give an example, where we were looking for a Arank 818 switch. And Arank 818, by definition, is a protocol that is defined to move video data, and we're talking about cockpit video, on optical links. So it's a protocol that this industry has adopted to move from analog video to digital video. And today you have a rank 818 um, digital video on most of the modern plane, civilian planes and uh, jet fighters or helicopters. Anyway, we've been tasked to do a, a rank 818 switch and we had to find a good solution to implement optical video and that's how we started to work with uh, optical modules and we started to partner with companies like Radial in France and Samtech in the US. So what kind of markets would these PFP4 high-speed communications solutions be a good fit for? We're looking at analog solutions and digital solutions as well, right? Yes, that's right. Today, in order to cope with the technology, you need to implement optical. We just talked about it. But also, people are willing to um, use the latest technology for analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. And this new generation of devices are using very high speed serial link to move the digital data into the computer. And you need high-speed platform in order to support this new generation of analog to digital and digital to analog. So we are proposing a solution. There are a lot of solutions in the VPX marketplace, but we are proposing similar technology on PCI Express. And the benefit of this platform is the fact that system integrator are able to use the level of technology that you would normally find on VPX, but to use it on workstation, you know, ground-based workstation. And the, the whole idea behind that is to offer the possibility for people who need the performance but don't need the high robustness because the system they are building is not flying, mainly stays on ground, or even operate into a naval in a ship, you know, where they usually have computer rooms, 
why paying the high premium, price premium of the VPX if you don't need the robustness. But still, if you are interfacing a very advanced electronic warfare system or a radar or where you need very advanced features, then you will be happy to find the same technology that you have on VPX but on a PC-based platform. And that's where the FMC interface that we have on our board creates the link because thanks to the FMC, people can reuse FMC boards, so very advanced interface, which have been originally defined for the uh, rugged market. So to make the long story short, the FMC interface that we have on our PCI Express platform allows system integrator to use the same technology as the VPX one, but they can use it on different form factor. That makes sense. Now, do you have any applications you can share? Yeah, we have uh, many. In fact, we have many customers. As you know, we've been doing uh, this type of PFP, so PCI Express FPGA platform, for more than 12 years now. So we have many customers. And the new PFP4, which is a platform designed to carry the 28 gig speed level for communication, has been co-financed by two companies which have a need for high speed, obviously. And the funny thing is, one is in the industry, in the telecom, in the 5G, in fact, type of application. This company located in France is making a GPON analyzer. So this is a piece of equipment that analyzes everything that goes on the fiber link. Okay. And because we are in the telecom, we have a specific telecom related protocol called GPON. And they needed to create a GPON analyzer. And because in the 5G marketplace, the speed is also going up. So they needed to have 25 gig capabilities. And the only option they had was to go through our platforms. So that's one case, telecom related. We have another one, which is a little bit more confidential because it's an electronic warfare type of application where we are partnering with people doing some radar simulators. And the need for our product was driven by the fact that they want to use the most advanced analog to digital and digital to analog devices. And they were looking for a FPGA platform could carry many, many links at 25 gig each. So you see, again, the same platform Thanks to the FMC, in one case is used for an electronic warfare application with very advanced analog to digital features. And in another one, by putting a different optical interface, it's used by a company acting in the telecom industry. So these are two examples which shows the benefit of having a high-tech 28 gig platform based on PCI Express. All right, Patrick, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, or the restaurant is closed, what would you have? What a question. Emilia, how are you... (laughs) How you do to create such (laughs) questions? No, what I would prefer... Oh, I don't know. I I like fish. We don't have the opportunity to eat fish uh, a lot, so fish is good. And it's so complicated to cook well fish. It's very fragile in a way that uh, you need to find the right place. So, no, good fish, well cooked, would be my choice. Awesome. Good choice. Well, Patrick, as always, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Emilia. Thanks a lot. Let's talk about 3D printing in space. Now, 3D printing has been a hot topic for space exploration for quite a while now. But how does microgravity affect 3D printing? Well, this was exactly the focus of a team of researchers from the University of West Virginia's microgravity research team. 
and they concentrated their efforts specifically on the effects that microgravity has on titania foam. But why titania foam? Well, University of West Virginia Associate Professor Sierros, who is also the Associate Chair for Research in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, explains this aspect of their research like this. He says, Transporting even a kilogram of material in space is expensive and storage is limited. So we're looking into what is called in situ resource utilization. We know the moon contains deposits of minerals very similar to the titanium dioxide used to make our foam. So the idea is you don't have to transport equipment from here to space because we can mine those resources on the moon and print the equipment that's necessary for the mission. This new research has been a long time coming. Sierros and the microgravity research team have been working with titania foam since 2016. Now, this team now works at the WVU labs, but their first experiments actually took place on a Boeing 727. During this test, students actually printed lines of foam onto glass slides during 20-second periods of weightlessness when the jet was at the top of its parabolic flight path. So titania foam has one very important benefit for space exploration and habitation, its ability to shield against ultraviolet light. In order to test titania foam's effectiveness at blocking UV waves, this team first shone light ranging from ultraviolet wavelengths up to the visible light spectrum, and then measured how much light was getting through the titania foam they printed. They also measured how much light got reflected back and how much was absorbed by the foam as well. And what they found was super cool. They discovered that their 3D printed film blocked almost all of the UV light, and also that very little visible light got through as well. And their film was only 200 microns thick. And even cooler, this team noticed that their new film also demonstrated photocatalytic properties, which means it can use light to promote chemical reactions that could do things like purify air or water. Another important aspect of this research is their outreach to young students in the area, like the Boy Scouts. Associate Professor Sierros explains this part of their research like this. He says, We're trying to integrate research into student careers at an early point. We have a student subgroup that's purely hardware, and they make the 3D printers. We have students leading materials development, automation, data analysis. The undergraduates who have been doing this work with the support of two very competitive NASA grants are participating in the whole research process. They have published peer-reviewed scientific articles and presented at conferences. This team's overall mission can be summed up like this. Our approach can help extend space exploration, allowing astronauts to use resources they already have available to them without necessitating a resupply mission. Yes, I love this. So if you want even more information about this 3D printing research from WVU or information about Techway, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978.
And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. <laughs> and of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some super exciting new upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of November 24th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.